Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabora here, just spending my spring break weekend all this week, so I finally get a chance to relax and have fun and do whatever I want, until I have to go back to class again. Which, by the way, I'm taking a cycling class, as usual, so that way I get to lose weight and, and just feel great and not have any problems. <laughs> so I'm getting there, so far. So anyway, um, I'm going to review a brand new movie that just came out uh, just a few weeks ago. But I actually saw the movie like about two weeks ago. It was on a Thursday. And I've been wanting to see this movie uh, ever since I saw the trailer. And I, I heard a lot of talk about it. And plus the fact that they're going to focus on nostalgia for for all the pop culture that we're getting, mostly the ones that we grew up with, like 80s and 90s, even 70s, and and even most of today, that's throwing in. So I figured, since this is also based on a novel, and I had a feeling this was going to be awesome anyway, I just finally uh, check out the movie Ready Player One, which once again, it's based on a novel by Ernest Klein. It's a story about an orphan teenager who wants up inside a virtual reality program known as the Oasis where he gets to go in and and try to find out uh, all the clues and something that's hidden around and the program basically promised him to actually win a full ownership of the Oasis if he completes all these missions. Uh, that is until another businessman uh, suddenly takes over. If I mean, this is sort of like, um, I guess you could say this was like um, the Willy Wonka of video games, in a way. <laughs> but you get to see like a lot of familiar characters, most of which are from movies and TV shows and video games that you definitely remember it even as a kid or even when you grew older <laughs> that sort of thing and the fact that Spielberg is actually working on this I thought this was interesting because after all Spielberg has been known for doing a lot of uh, you know, fantasy films or any other genres that he comes up with no matter what Yeah, the last Spielberg film I saw of course was the BFG which was you know, based on the book by Ron Dow, which wasn't a big hit, sadly. Uh, didn't do very well. It was actually one of uh, Spielberg's uh, biggest flops, and that's a shame, because I thought it was a very good movie. I have reviewed that film, though, but maybe someday if I thought about it, I wouldn't mind. Uh, I still don't have it on Blu-ray yet, so... But I did saw it in theaters, and I had a chance uh, back in 2016. Um, but anyway, since um, this is a recent film that he's doing, I figured this would be a good time for me to check it out. And and I just uh, I'm just amazed, and I was very uh, I was very uh, stunned, and and just feel very happy about the way this was going but then I, I understand there are some issues with the story a little bit but maybe that was the problem and already it's becoming the highest grossing film already to this day and I'm happy to see that it's doing very well at the box office so it sounds like this is the kind of movie I would definitely watch I mean just like how I watch uh, movies like Tron uh, Loma Tron Legacy uh, Scott Pilgrim vs. the World and all this other stuff that sort of way. And I'm going to tell you this, though. Even for that point alone, this is a better film that that Pixels and Jumanji Welcome to the Jungle failed to do so. But hey, that, this is my opinion, and I'm going to keep it that way. <laughs> well, anyway, let, let's get back to the review. It stars Ty Sheridan, uh, Olivia Cook, uh, Ben Mendelsohn, T.J. Miller, of course, he's been on other stuff like Deadpool, uh, Cloverfield, and <clears throat> uh, 
the emoji movie. Okay, sorry. I I know. I I I did that on purpose. I know. I'm just trying to be. Fun. Okay, whatever. Simon Pegg. It's great to see him too. I mean, he's been doing a lot um, ever since uh, Shaun of the Dead, along with um, Hot Fuzz. You know, with Nick Frost. You know, with Paul, along with Paul and The World's End. He also has done other films too, like Star Trek and uh, Mission Impossible and all of that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Mark Wylands, uh, Philip Sayo, Wen Resaki, and Hannah John Kamen. Yeah, it's written by Syke Penn, who also had work on other films. Um, I believe he also worked on one of the X-Men sequels. Well, there you go. <laughs> Along with Ernest Cline, which is based on the novel, and it's directed by Steven Spielberg. The movie began set in the futuristic city of Columbus, Ohio in 2045, where many of the Earth's population had suddenly climbed into slum-like cities, which that includes all these apartments and trailer parks all stacked up in a high-rise like a ton of rocks and of course that one trailer park looks almost like a junkyard here and there yeah not very pretty either well anyway it's also due to the fact that of a variety of geopolitical issues that's spreading around but to escape their destination, they discover a virtual reality world called the Oasis, where they get to spend all their time in numerous uh, activities such as work, education, and entertainment. All of a sudden, the users discovered an Easter egg hunting video game called NRX Quest, which is created by the late creator of the Oasis, James Holiday. The first to find the Easter egg locks behind the gates, which contains free keys in order for them to enter the world, which had all these hidden secrets behind, which you have to go to each and every level to choose in order to complete the mission. So that way, their last prize will earn them a full-time ownership of the company. Fortunately, not many people had uh, tried to do it, and they, for those who had tried, actually failed to do so. And I know it's it's probably the hardest uh, game to, to choose. But anyway, it attracted a number of Gunters, who are eight Hunters, to actually play the game. And that's when we begin to find out where the new CEO of a video conglomerate called Innovative Online Industries, also known as IOI, you know, for short, um, named Nolan Sorrento, which he has an army of players known as the Sixers. And he wants to be able to seek the prize and be able to become the ownership of the company. So that's where they decided to have a vehicle waste that's located inside New York City and that's when we discovered an orphan teenager named Wade Watts who actually created his own avatar that looks almost like uh, Quicksilver named Parcival and he's partnered with a giant ogre type uh, avatar a male named Ick so they teamed up and later be friends with another player, definitely a well-known player, named Ultimus. Which, once they uh, went inside the game, Parviso actually had a, a DeLorean from Back to the Future. And many of the other players have very familiar cars that they got from other video games and you know, TV shows or movies or whatever. And once they entered the race, they started to drive all the way straight to all these other um, obstacles around 
And that's where we discovered the T-Rex from Jurassic Park and King Kong. And anyway, uh, once uh, Parvacel suddenly enters the finish line, which was a dead end, uh, he suddenly saves Optimus from crashing all the way down into the hole. But her motorcycle was uh, damaged, and they decided to have it repaired. So Ek, however, repairs uh, her motorcycle, so that way she'll keep it going and running. Unfortunately, since the game is being zeroed out, um, he, he begins to discover that um, he wanted to go inside uh, the personal life of James Holiday. So, Wade suddenly studies uh, by going inside the Oasis Library and find out uh, the past life of James Holiday. And the sequel behind this was to him to actually go backwards inside the game. And once he went backwards, that's when he finally wins his first prize. So he actually has the key. He, because of that sequel alone, he decided to join in with Ake, Ultimus, and two more players, uh, Dalto and Sho. So they, they all finished the quest all together by going backwards, and then now <laughs> became simply known as the High Five. IOI had took interest by actually exhuming their real life identities, so Nolan hires a bounty hunter named IROC, which of course Nolan had to use his avatar to make him look like a bloated uh, Clark Kent <laughs> in that sort of way. Well, anyway, he hires him to actually enter inside a, a local bar. Nolan suddenly wants to approach Wade and attempting to convince him to, to solve the NRX quest by joining uh, IOI, but he refuses. And I know there's a lot of pop culture references a lot of jokes um, going towards all the 80s movies, like the John Hughes films, so to speak. Uh, Wade actually dressed up as Buckaroo Banzai for his date with Optimus, which Optimus had a, a lovely red dress. So they were dancing the night away to the song, <laughs> just to go old school, uh, the Bee Gees uh, Staying Alive, which was heard from the movie Saturday Night Fever. <laughs> but by the time Wade suddenly uh, reveals his real name to Optimus, that's when Iraq overheard and and Nolan hires his assistant uh, F. Now Zandor to attack Wade's slum, which he actually lives with his aunt which his aunt also has his boyfriend, who's a complete asshole. But he actually got um, <clears throat> both of them killed. So then Wade was being taken over and was rescued by Ultimate's real-life friends and was taken inside the Gunter hideout. That's when we find out that Ultimus turns out to be uh, Samantha Cook. Because Samantha actually did use her avatar, Optimus. Well, we, we also begin to learn that Samantha actually had um, a birthmark uh, between her eye. So then, they're together just to discover more of Holiday's uh, secret plans by going inside the game along with um, the rest of the Hi Fi team to go into each and every secret compartments uh, on which way to go in order to grab the key and be able to to go on their next mission here and there. So I don't want to give away too much of how the film was going but that's basically what the story was about so if you haven't seen the movie then I mean it's still playing in feeders so you'll still have a chance to check it out for yourself just to get to the story. Now I haven't read the novel, so I can't say much about how it turns out. I could probably say that half of it was in the novel from what I heard. 
but I can't go all the way through detail after detail because then that's going to take up some time. But I'll, I'll say for one thing, <clears throat> well, the story does get complicated at times. I mean, it, it takes the time and risk just to get there, but it gets even more difficult than it ever is, so, yeah. Well, anyway. But I'm just going to get to the cast. Um, I thought Ty Sheridan did okay in the film. I mean, granted, I know it's not exactly the kind of character that you expected from the movie. Um, I know people said that it had a lack of character development, um, well, coming from other people. I think he was decent. I I'm just going to say this. He was decent. I, You know, I, I know... I know it's not easy trying to find like a character that's that's going to be as likable as ever. I mean, as we we expect it to be, but because you wanted to have your character to be as smart and energetic as ever, that's what I expected to see. And and yeah, he was smart, but I think he could have done a little bit better. Probably would have written better in a way. But Ty Sheridan did okay, so I'll just say that. Um, some <clears throat> uh, Olivia Cook did a fine job playing Samantha Cook because um, she had her avatar Optimus, yeah, just like how Wade had his uh, <laughs> uh, avatar uh, Possible. So that's interesting, and, and I thought they sparked some chemistry right there uh, when it comes to the characters that they had to play uh, on or off um, the Oasis. Actor Ben Mendelsohn as Nolan Sorrento, hmm, he was alright. I mean, he plays basically your typical CEO that's just like Vince McMahon in a way. I mean, I mean, he's, he's an asshole. Granted, I mean, he wants to to own the Oasis himself. He wants to take over and and be able to run the company for himself uh, along with the rest of his crew they're going after him because that's how they do it in movies these days they always have those cliches uh, uh, T.J. Mello did a great job uh, playing the the Bonnie Hunter I Rock. I mean it was, it's hard to believe that was actually him doing the voice Simon Pig as Ogden Morrow I mean he which uh, he's, of course, the co-creator of the Oasis that he played. Um, but he left the company mostly due to some unhealthy reasons that's happening between the game. Um, it, it's kind of interesting to see a uh, Summer Pig just using an American accent. Because he's starting to sound more like, sort of sudden in a way. Like a sudden accent. Uh, the rest of the other actors, like Mark uh, Rylance, along with uh, Philip Zio, Morisaki, and, and Hannah John Kamen, they, they all did a great job. I mean, uh, it, it is pretty interesting to see their secrets uh, behind <laughs> the Oasis that, when they had their avatars and go on. Well, there you go. <laughs> I know, I, I'm just trying to keep up with it uh, as we speak. Um, it does have some great special effects. I mean, of course it's CGI, but it's rather stunning CGI that they use. I mean, it was great to see when they try to get into all these uh, obstacles and all these other uh, secrets that they went inside. I thought it was really clever. It was really funny the way they did them. Um, yeah, there's going to be some... Just maybe a tiny spoiler a little bit, just not too much. I, I just didn't want to give away too much of the story. Um, but there are a lot of great pop culture references that they had in the film. Like, as I mentioned, there was there was a John Hughes uh, comedies that, that they went into the dialogue. Like, for example, they throw in, uh, <laughs> like, um, Fellers Bueller's Day Off, uh, Breakfast Club, uh, Sixteen Candles in a way. Uh, they even mention uh, Fast Times of Richmond High, which is not a John Hughes comedy. I know, that was a different one. Uh, we did see uh, Parseval um, actually wearing, the, you're going to love this, a Thundercats logo um, 
belts that he has. Um, and speaking of which, there were a lot of um, a lot of 80s and 90s nostalgia right in the mix. Like you can see, I never thought I would spot all this stuff, but then I I actually discovered uh, the Greatest American Hero logo on there. They even had um, other tags like you know, Batman, uh, Wonder Woman, and Superman. Uh, and yes, um, as for some of the other scenes, they even show the Iron Giant. It was great to see the Iron Giant in there. And not only the Iron Giant, but you also saw other characters that you're totally familiar with. Even some newer ones, like for example, they put in uh, Overwatch. Yeah, that's a new game that came out uh, just um, since 2016. So that, that was like two years ago at this point. Yeah, I, I never thought I would spot that too, because that's a brand new game, uh, Overwatch. Uh, they also have Minecraft in there. They they had um, yes, there, there's even Chucky in there. Uh, there's also um, there's also the Ninja Turtles. Unfortunately, it was the raw Ninja Turtles. They got the Michael Bay versions instead of the the Ninja Turtles that they should have picked up, which is the 1990 live action Ninja Turtles as we all know and love. Yeah, see, they, I mean, how could they totally forget that? It doesn't make any sense. But they also had um, Halo in there. I never thought I would spot Halo. In, in that battle, and then, then there's even Gundam. <sighs> Gundam. Never thought I would see that either. <laughs> there was like a lot of stuff in there. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> but I, I had to admit, I mean, the moment I saw that, I, I was just like, I was like really happy. I was like, thank you, movie. I mean, thank you for actually showing all the characters that I grew up in love. <laughs> In that sort of way, so yeah, I, I know, I know. I mean, hey, I mean the movie may be nerdy as it is. I mean, hey, but let's face it, I'm a geek, so <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that. It's just sometimes it's whenever you see some of your favorite characters that you all know and love, you're definitely gonna start geeking out. So that's what happens. <laughs> Um, but anyway, I thought it was virtually stunning to see all the characters uh, working together. So it's kind of like how they did it in Who Framed Roger Rabbit, where you begin to spot all your favorite cartoon characters like like Betty Boop, uh, Bugs Bunny, Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck, Daffy Duck, uh, um, or like Droopy, Tom and Jerry, or or any other kind. I mean, you get a lot of cartoon characters that you never thought you would see expected or fine even Woody Woodpecker on there so yeah when they did the movie Who Framed Roger Rabbit so but it's a good comparison right there too uh, anyway I also love the score too um, it was actually done by Alan Silvestri I was amazed to actually hear his score um, some of them were pretty memorable others were just yeah, it was alright and not to mention, uh, they also have a mix of 80 songs too. Like for example, they have the song uh, "Jump" by Van Halen, and of course they even put in the Bee Gees song "Staying Alive," as I mentioned. They even had the song by Joan Jett called "I Hate Myself for Loving You," and all of that. I mean, that was just—it just fits pretty well for this movie because. It's meant to be. I mean, considering it's a futuristic virtual reality world as we know it. I mean, you get to do whatever you want. You, you get to play all your favorite games. You get to actually have fun doing all those other activities, you know, to to just make you go you know, gaga for. Um, and yes, just for another quick uh, spoiler here. Yes, they even have Atari 2600 in the movie. It's great to see that. Because I once had the Atari 2600 from my father. Yeah, because my father had the system. He still has it, I believe. 
But I, I just never thought I'd be able to see that in the movie. So it's really cool. Yeah. And since it's already mentioned in the novel, I guess it's okay to mention that there's actually an adventure game that's that's in there. <clears throat> and I remember playing Adventure too when you know, when I was still living with my father together and, and when he bought in his Atari twenty six hundred he always tries to go into the, the secrets, uh, yeah, along with my mom, because we all play the game. We're trying to go into the secrets uh, behind Adventure, so there you go. It's all put together right away. <clears throat> so. Um, so yeah, the effects themselves were actually done by um, ILOM, the Industrial Light of Magic, so it's perfect, they got that. But despite of its issues, I still think it's an awesome, exciting, entertaining, and virtually stunning film that I've ever saw. And I'm glad I did. I definitely want to see it again. And I'm hopefully and I will and then later buy the Blu-ray so I can watch it anytime. And I'm glad to see it's a highest grossing film so far to date, because it just made four hundred and seventy four point eight million dollars out of its hundred and seventy five million dollar budget so it's perfect and so I'm glad to see that Spielberg did not have a flop this time and in fact he just had a follow-up with his film The Post with Tom Hanks and Miller Street yeah it's just a different drama I haven't seen that yet so I can't say on that one but hey, I'm just happy that he's he still has it in him. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I give Weddy Player One five stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.